Welcome to Tech Field Day at Ona. Hi, I'm JR Rivers, co-founder and CEO of Cumulus Networks. I am Jason Edelman. I blog at jedelman.com. I'm on Twitter at jedelman8. I'm Chris Margett. I'm an independent network consultant, and I'm on the Twitter at Chris Margett. And I'm Tom Hollingsworth, prolific blogger at networkingnerd.net and occasional snarky tweeter at Networking Nerd. JR, why don't you tell us a little bit about Cumulus Networks? So, Cumulus, the, the fundamental business that we're in uh, is we, make, we sell a Linux distribution that works on top of what we call bare metal networking elements. The, the observation that we made, uh, I, you know, I've been in the networking industry for 16 years, you know, worked at Cisco for actually longer than that, 20 years now, unfortunately. <laughs> worked at Cisco for 16 years. The, uh, you know, the observation is that you know, back in the day we had to do physics and, and building networking hardware and, and hot software was super hard. And uh, technology's matured quite a bit. Uh, there's a, a lot of fundamental technology you can buy in silicon. Hardware manufacturers know how to make these things. Um, and from a customer's perspective, on, on especially in the data center around networking, building super high capacity IP fabrics is kind of the fundamental goal that they have. And the big missing element was a, a software base that really made sense for them. And as we looked at it, uh, as really studied the market both historically as well as looking into the future, we came to the conclusion that something that was literally Linux, not based on Linux, but literally Linux, um, would, would really ease operators' pains and really not just in terms of, of CapEx or you know, support costs, but also in terms of just general day-to-day -day operational cost. And so we started the company and that's where we're at. Question actually, you know, right now there's a lot of talk in SDN to reduce the OpEx model. Yeah. And you know, right now on the surface it seems like current cumulus targets reducing the capex so how do you how do you sort of see yourselves playing to the market is it is it capex and opex or is it targeted opex day one yeah that's capex day one rather no that's an interesting question i'm going to up level the answer a little bit so sorry if i don't give you what you want go back but you know our goal is to make networks faster easier and affordable and the, the general like thesis, the thing that gets me up every day and makes me get into this thing, is I'm completely convinced that the data center networks are, are way underbuilt right now. And the number one reason they're underbuilt is because it costs too much to buy them and it costs too much to deploy them. That in general, when I've talked to any, any customer, almost any scale I talk to, would rather have a better, higher capacity fabric. All right. All right? And so we exist to help deal with all the aspects of it. So we're not just a CapEx play, we're not just an OpEx play, we're trying to get that whole thing faster, easier, and affordable. Do you see the OpEx savings is, is part of the realize for the average networking person due to the skill sets required potentially day one? Or if your customer base, if it's hyperscale, they already have the skill sets to manage no less like Cumulus. If people always ask that question. and. The real answer to that is it's it's the midsize that's the hardest. Right. So um, if you go to a company, any company that has you know five sysadmins and five people on their IT staff, in general, those people are generalists. They understand operating systems, applications, networking, storage, all of those pieces. Um, if you look into somebody that's building out a Hadoop cluster, it's usually a bunch of sysadmins that start it because they have to do storage, they have to do you know server deployment. So. That's why we chose Linux as, a, as, a, as not the, again, the base, but Linux as the networking element. It's because it's really easy for those people to just grab it and go. So for a sysadmin to make this thing fly, it's really super trivial. Um, at the, like you said, kind of at a mega scale, um, again, these people are, you know, actually in general, most people want to get to the point where they're highly uh, automated. The mega scales will, will always put their money where their mouth is on that because it's such a big impact on them. They're really easy. They're not doing development. No one's like writing C code at these things. What they're trying to do is figure out how to build them into auditing, configuration management, user management, monitoring, all of the, the tools that they need to run their operation. And, and that's the part that they're looking for. I think last on. week there was a blog actually too that said, this is a systems guy, we're networking. As a networking guy, we're in Linux. Or I guess they're really, for the customers you have, is the third option, don't do either, but leverage the tools, that, you know, load the agents of your choice on that you don't really need to know Linux or network, well, networking, you still need to know, but in terms of can you bypass the Linux knowledge a little bit if you're, if you're leveraging something like a puppet or a chef to manage Cumulus? You kind of can, but I mean, at least from, from my standpoint, it, um, the, the reality is such that if, 
if you're a networking person and you believe that your job as a networking only person will sustain for very long, you know, not to sound brutal, but that's flawed thinking. Realistically, you should go out and figure out what it takes to be somewhat of a generalist because you will become more valuable. Now, your job may henceforth always be around networking, but as a generalist, you'll be more valuable to your organization, right? And so, I don't think it's so much trying to hide anything from somebody as much as it making it people that can do what they need to do really quickly. You know, I think the bottom line is that network guys have to be more aware of this ecosystem that's been emerging for years, it seems like, um, in, the, in the system world. Yeah, and it, 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 it sounds scary to a lot of people to start with, but I, we interact with people that are like pure play, CCIE networking people for a long time. All of a sudden they get into this thing and they're just like, I don't know, I don't know. And then they start getting in and wait a minute, I've always wanted to be able to do this, and wow, this is really easy. And hey, I've always wanted to be able to do that, and hey, this is really easy. You know, and um, you know, people talk about Puppet and Chef, and those are great tools if you know how to use them. But you know, you can also administer these systems with Bash and, and Python and you know, it's a dumb example with one of our networking platforms is, uh, you know, if you look at a, a monitoring plane, a lot of times people want to have one, one set of people are responsible for environmentals, power supplies, thermals, that kind of stuff. And if they look, if you look at what they're doing on the server side, usually that all goes back to typically it's like a Nagios type back end. So you take one of these networking platforms, you take Collect D, fire it back to the Nagios back end for those pieces. You take a whole other set and you send it off to you know, like a graphite or something for performance management, traffic engineering. And then like we go to a CCIE and they're like, wait a minute, you can do that? This is really cool. I've always wanted to be able to do this, you know? <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm one of those guys, right? CCI network guy for the past several years, but in the past 12 to 18 months, I'm trying to immerse myself into this world of you know, Linux, programming, scripting, you know, the system world, and you know, it's been eye-opening because there's so much going on out there that can impact the network space that really isn't new out there. But So I hear you yeah. and uh, it's cool. And some of it's not so much, I mean, people worry about scripting and having to write C code and like build things and stuff. A lot of it really is just download a package that already exists and doing some config. So it's really text editing that, you know, that's your biggest piece. Right. Now, you had an announcement this week that you just released uh, QBMS Linux 2.0 with right. uh, support for the Trident 2 chipset. Right. Do you see Trident 2 becoming the go-to platform kind of in the way that, that Intel chips kind of became the, the baseline for every portable computing device out there? Trident 2 being the, the, the one that won the war, I guess, and you know, do you eventually see a point where, where I can buy a Trident 2 chipset directly from Broadcom or from a white box vendor? Um, I'm going to answer your last question first and okay. your first question last. Okay. So you can buy a Trident 2 chipset from a supply chain. So our hardware partners all have resale channels. You can go to them. You can order it. You'll show up. And, uh, Trident, Trident 2 av hardware availability is like end of November, but by the time it becomes avail available through the channel, it's like a two-week delivery. You order it two weeks later, the box shows up with no operating system on it. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that gets you where you're going. That's now, a chip or that's a switch? The switch. Yes, yes. Well, like from a white box. But okay. Yeah, the switch, the, the chip itself, inevitably that becomes a relationship with Broadcom. Sure. Um, yeah, it's unclear to me that it'll ever end up like you going down to, to online and buying an Intel CPU because oftentimes people aren't even really putting sockets around there. If you, if you look at Intel, they engineer the chip with the expectation that a socket exists. And so it's actually super hard for them to support that, but that's what their customer base expects. It also helps them so they can upsell and, and all that, so it helps their financial model. Whereas someone like Broadcom doesn't really design for a, a socket to live. Right. Um, now back to your, your first question. Um, I believe that Trident 2 is kind of a pivotal moment in networking history. You know, kind of mark this date and time and recognize that up until recently, um, you ended up with a, a bunch of different platforms that you needed to do for diff uh, different things. So you'd have maybe a, a platform that was one gig focused that you connected to your servers, and you'd have a chassis that you used for aggregation. Um, there wasn't enough capacity that you could actually really build systems out of you know, either fixed configuration boxes or even uh, a chassis that's built on a, a we call it cloth in a box out of Trident. Um, Arista did a great job of a cloth in the box with their the, some of their early products where they take a fixed configuration platform and connect up a bunch of these fulcrum chips as cloths, but that hadn't really taken on. With Trident 2, you see this whole level of convergence is, is occurring. You know, you're going to see later this week, uh, and CMA is going to come out with their announcement. And yeah, they're going to talk about some proprietary hardware, but it's mostly based on Trident 2. 
Um, our hardware partners are coming out with platforms based on Trident 2. People are going to come out with chassis that are all class in the box based on Trident 2. And some of them will be closed source, like in CMA, some of them will be closed source. I, I think you'll see like an Arista or a Juniper probably do the same thing. You're gonna see some, we'll call them open source type chassis as well, ones that look like the fixed configuration products that we have, you know, are our hardware partners. You're gonna see a channel where you can buy class in a box hardware without a networking OS on it. And that's what's kind of game changing here. We've recognized that, hey, the hardware piece of this thing is available. If uh, if I wanted to become familiar with your network operating system, but you know, don't want to buy a Trident Two uh, white box switch, do you support other platforms? Is there you know VM kind of thing, or can I can I run this up on a on a x86 server? Or yeah, so we have um, in the short term we have uh, giggy switches people can buy if they want to get familiar with it in a hardware context. We have a customer workbench that people can kind of log into and, and explore it in a VM context. Sometime within the next three or four months, we'll have the ability to uh, get a, get VMs that you can use. Um, the the nuance to the to the VM and the reason why we haven't released it yet to the public is we want that VM to look just like the hardware platform that you think it is. So like if you think you're buying an Acton blah 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 or a Penguin X Y Z or a Quanta you know ABC, we want that VM to be that thing. And so we're just kind of doing some doctoring around to make sure that it's, you can give it the personality, it all behaves correctly and stuff like that, so it's the right experience. And the reason that's important, and it's, it's kind of all ties back to why we chose that, that it is Linux, and li not Linux-like and Linux-based, but we do Linux, and so you can take these VMs, you can build your whole network subsystem out of it, work out all your configuration management, your monitoring, everything in that context, and then apply it to hardware. Mm -hmm. and, and I do this all the time, like I, because I, this is super important to me, like fast, easy, affordable, right? So I, I want to make sure that we're doing that, and I do it like weekly. I go through and build up a new topology, and I work it on the VMs, and I put it on top of hardware, and it's, I get like giddy every time. Gotcha. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's game-changing, really, is in terms of we're seeing hardware prices come down. And a lot of the talk right now with Cumulus is around the data center. You know, do you envision a day where we're talking about white box in the wiring closet, you know, in the campus, through with Cumulus? Yeah, I don't. I don't see any fundamental reason why that doesn't happen. You know, obviously we're a young company. We have to stay focused on our eight ball, so we're there. But the the fundamental model is such that that, that should be true. The the wiring closet switch hardware that you buy from the suppliers isn't substantially differentiated. Um, the you know having a, a, a call it a reasonably thin operating system that runs on top of these things that can be managed through you know back end controller that provides authentication access, you know, quarantining of, 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 of access, you know, VXLAN type gateways out to get to you know for guest network access makes sense for wiring closet, and makes sense for wireless as well. What about the port density? Yeah, and these, I mean, I like to, I mean, everybody's already selling stuff based on try these, not try to, but Broadcom chipsets. So you can buy 48 plus 4 10 gig uplinks out of, you know, for one gig boxes, and these are in the, you know, the less than two thousand dollar list price. Gotcha. I, I guess I'm in, in my head of a wiring closets, you know, a 13 slot switch. Uh, yeah, some people do that, but more often than not nowadays, people are just are using stackables for the wiring closet. The, the, the 6500 in the wiring closet has been a long time. Yeah. Like one of the business, the first business I was in at Cisco, I was there for 12 years, was kind of the campus switch business. And when I left in 2005, the end of 2005, it was a $6.5 billion business, and it was way larger than the 6000 Gala 6000 business. Is a, is a stackable white box switch something that uh, yeah. is shipping today? Or? Uh, so our hardware manufacturer, our hardware partners rather, uh, make boxes that can be stackable. We're, we're not running on a stackable context. Um, realistically, the, it, there was a day when we did stackable and a lot of that was kind of a, and it was a layer two domain, that was kind of a Cisco-ism where they really wanted all the control and, and management to live in the 6500 in the basement, right? Sure. I mean, I'm sure you guys are familiar with those architectures. Uh, in a modern campus, especially with VXLAN type overlays, it actually makes more sense to just Put, make, make the wiring closet itself a layer three isolated from the rest of the campus. Right, because everybody usually runs DHCP anyways. You run it right out of the wiring closet and you can, and then it makes it much more straightforward. So you just build up a little sure. ring inside the wiring closet, route out of it, and you're a happy little clown. So, so it's familiar looking hardware. Yeah. Your OS, which is Linux, is, is my you know network administrator experience 
a similar thing where I've got a command line that I deal with on the switch or, or some other configuration primitives or bash? <laughs> yeah. For the, for the most part it's bash. If you're running a routing protocol, we you know, we work with Quagga or Bird, you know, we we uh, we do a one of the things the characteristics of our distribution is we'll, you know, do pro performance enhancements or functional behavior uh, fixes in, in either routing protocol. And then we will uh, feed it back upstream, but usually that takes a while. So our distribution is a little bit ahead of upstream usually on these. I, mean, things. I get that it's Bash, but it's yeah. like uh, I, I guess I'm thinking I've never created a VLAN in Bash before. Yeah. So is there a new but, command that creates the VLAN? Or yeah, but I mean, you're, a, you're a CCIE, right? Uh, I'm not. Have you ever have you ever been a CCI or been a Cisco uh, system administrator? Yes. Great. So when someone gets a CCIE, you learn two things. You learn how networking works, and you learn how to make networking work the way Cisco wants you to make networking work. Sure. Right? We don't change how networking works. That, that is what it is. I mean, that's, that's the difference between us and like an open flow type model. We don't change any of that. It's just what command you type. So there's like, there's a command that creates a VLAN. You know, it's different than the Cisco command, but it's still there's a command that creates a VLAN. Got it. Okay. And so that's just a binary that's sitting on the file system that does something. Yeah, it's like actually part it. of the kernel. The kernel already supports the concept of a Linux bridge. You set up a Linux bridge. You add interfaces yeah. into it. You give it tags. You do all those things. Gotcha. So obviously, your switch uh, product running Linux, the Linux is there to bring the hardware drivers up to make sure all the ports are passing traffic and yeah. that run the system. Would you support some kind of movement in the open source community to rewrite a shell that functions similarly to other operating systems to ease the transition period? Yeah, we'd be happy. I mean, Viata tried that and they, and they have some, some IP around that. It's actually open source. You can get it and use it if someone wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, we would we would clearly be supportive of it. There's nothing that we believe stands in the way. Uh, it might help ease the transaction, but um, I will assert that in general, um, you should take a hard look at that before you make the step because oftentimes you're, you're kind of limping yourself along and you, you, it's almost easier to sit down and say, okay, great, today I need to learn how to create a VLAN. Oh, wow, that was really easy. And tomorrow I need to have, uh, learn how to add a route. Wow, that was easy. Okay, this thing is not scary anymore. Therefore, I will use, you know, I'll use some automation tool to automate setting up all these things and go. So it's more the, the familiar to Linux people stuff. I mean, maybe, am I typing BRCTL? Yeah, the point exactly. There you go. Okay. okay that, that, you just made a VLAN. See? You actually know how to create a VLAN unless you lied earlier. Well, I, 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 I've certainly created bridges on Linux before. There you so. go. So there you go. Right. It's, it's that easy. And, and VXLAN, which is an overlay technology, you do BRCTL and BR, BRCTL add IF, and you add, put a VXLAN in there. And now you have a VXLAN enabled bridge that you can then stitch up into, you know, with all the rest of the other VXLAN enabled bridges. Just in your system. Question actually, you mentioned super easy. I mentioned earlier, you guys, you know, versus the OpenFlow camp, which is changing things. You know, we're at Ono, a lot of discussion around SDN and OpenFlow, so can you just sort of clarify the messaging around <laughs> Cumulus being an SDN company uh, versus you know, what you're actually doing? So I would not put us in the SDN camp, um, and it's the hard part is because SDN means so many things to so many different people, right? So I always like try to disambiguate it. There's the construct of OpenFlow, and, and it gives you very fine-grained control over how the system behaves. And for certain sets of customers, that makes a ton of sense, right? Um, for we're focused more on what we'll call kind of classical networking with, with high functionality and high capacity. And in that context, technologies like a network virtualization via overlay is something that it is kind of more closely related to us. So we work with you know, some of the companies like a, a Nuage or a, a VMware Nicira, um, both as a kind of ships in the night providing an IP fabric for their customers and also as a L2 gateway. So like let's say you use NSX to create a VX uh, a logical network. You can add one of our physical interfaces or a VLAN into that through this that VXLAN construct and you know, and build networks that way with them as an orchestrating controller. Well, I just wanted to clarify again yeah. for everyone else that's looking in that you know there isn't you wouldn't be looking to manage a cumulus switch with a downloadable open source controller or even off the shelf. Uh, this is meant for traditional L2, L3, yep. and manage your overlay network um, right. separately than you'll manage right. your cumulus network. Yeah. So. So you absolutely got that. Um, the, the next piece to kind of step into is when you look at the systems management paradigm that people use around servers, there's this general premise that you, you want to uh, 
when a, a new system comes in or you decide to rebuild a, an environment, you want to push everything onto it and have it kind of be somewhat self-aware when you're done. You don't want to have to manually program every little thing separately. Right. So we've added little pieces of technology that are also open source that um, make it easy for people to do that. Uh, one, one of them is called the prescribed topology manager. Super simple premise. You can describe a topology, your cabling plant, in a dot file, which is, you can use all these graphing tools to render a dot files. And then you push that out to every platform, so they all know what the topology is supposed to look like. And you push out a set of scripts where if you and I are supposed to be connected on a certain interface, I'll run the script, the, the past script, which will do something like bring up routing on our interface or put, my, put this into a bridge or whatever. And if it's not, you run the fail script. And the fail script will go off and send an alert to somebody and say, hey, I'm connected to Jason, and you know, I don't know who this guy is, but he's not supposed to be here, right? And then someone can reconcile it. So what it does is it, it takes a lot of the things where people used to write kind of centralized orchestrating controllers, and it makes it to a system-by-system system distributed decision, which is really easy to noodle about. That's what's super cool about it. It's really easy to determine what that behavior should be. All right, well, it sounds like Cumulus is doing some really exciting things, and it's probably going to be very disruptive to some of our bigger vendor brethren out there. So I think that a lot of people out there really need to pay attention to what you guys are doing, because it's, it's going to change the way that they view networking over the course of the next couple of years. Thanks. Yeah, and if you want to learn more about ONUG and Tech Field Day, check out our website, techfieldday.com.